Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, welcome, we're so happy to have you. And um, on behalf of the um, Holocaust Committee at uh, Westchester Jewish Center, we welcome everyone. Um, we're so happy to be welcoming Dr. Sam Casso, who wrote a book of the same name of the film, Who Will Write Our History. We hope by now you've seen or read the book and we're honored to have him here with us. I'd like to kick off the conversation with Rabbi Arnowitz, um, who we're so blessed to have this morning, and he's going to say a few words. Rabbi. I was just waiting for you to unmute me, but I'll unmute myself. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I'm so glad to have you with us. I'm so glad that we are moving forward with this program. As words of welcome, I just wanted to uh, thank our, our Holocaust Education Committee and the Adult Education Committee for co-sponsoring um, the program this morning. Uh, this program was scheduled to happen in connection with Yom HaShoah uh, almost two months ago now. And it has been a, a wild time, a time like nothing we've ever experienced um, before uh, in recent memory. And there was a question whether or not we should move forward with doing this program at all. And I want to say I'm so pleased that, that we have decided to do it and that we're here and we're recording it and we'll share it and you are all here. Because this program is about history. And uh, I had the privilege of viewing uh, the movie who will write our history almost two years ago. It, it, well, I was still the rabbi in Norfolk, Virginia. It played at a, a local art house movie theater sponsored by the Virginia Film Festival and the Holocaust Commission of Tidewater. And I was, it is a marvelous piece of work. I was just um, incredibly moved by it. I hope that, that many of you uh, on this uh, Zoom have had the chance to view it. If you have not, uh, I believe it is still available. Um, and streaming, if you if you search for it, is well worth watching because it so highlights the idea that the story we tell of our past is so intricately connected with how the history is told. And Yom HaShoah, we're able to have a, a virtual you know ceremony which was, I'm, I'm glad, but was not the same, it is about exactly that. It's about telling the stories, telling the history, making sure that we, as best as we can, understand what happened so that we never forget and history doesn't repeat itself. And th this movie and this book, the product of, of Dr. Kassow's work, and as you'll hear, the amazing work of... Uh, of Ringel Bloom and his, his Oinig Shabbos program does exactly that. It, it, it gives us a collection of history of who the people were who lived in the Warsaw Ghetto, how they lived before the Shoah, how they lived after, uh, throughout the, the time in the ghetto, has, has absolutely changed our understanding of what life was like in the ghetto and what life was like in pre-war uh, pre Warsaw. And I'm so grateful um, that we can, in the spirit of Yom HaShoah, even these two months later, honor this telling of history, continue to tell the story ourselves, and thus to fulfill the purpose of Yom HaShoah even a little later, which is to educate, to understand, and to never forget. So call a kavod to our uh, Holocaust Education Committee, and thank you for being here, Dr. Casso. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, before we kick off, I just want to give you all um, a, a brief um, description about our format today. We'll be together for the next hour, of course, and Dr. Kassau will be speaking for about 40 minutes. Um, while you're listening, if you have a question, we'd love you to use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to type it in. And during the last 15 minutes or so, we'll choose a few of these questions. We have some of our own and we'll be asking um, Dr. Casso and getting his response. We're also recording this conversation, so if you have to step out or you wanna share it with your friends afterwards, um, you'll have that by tomorrow up on the WJC website. Um, and we just are so happy that you're all here. 
Remember to use the chat box. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Castle. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm sorry uh, we can't do this in uh, person, but uh, I'm very uh, honored that uh, uh, you invited me to uh, take part in in your uh, in your very important event, and uh, thank you, Rabbi. I want to thank the committee. Uh, I I'm talking about one of the most uh, important examples of cultural resistance that took place during the Holocaust. That is the uh, secret archive, the Onik Shabbos archive, uh, founded by Emanuel Ringelblum uh, in 1940. On March 1st, 1944, uh, just a few days before the Germans uh, caught him and killed him, are, are you able to hear me? Hello? Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we hear you very well. Thank you. Yeah. So on March 1st, 1944, just a few days before the Germans caught him and murdered him along with his family, Emanuel Ringelblum wrote one of his last letters to a friend who, like himself, was hiding in German-occupied Warsaw. And in this letter, Ringelblum asked, uh, what happens if we're caught? What happens if none of us survive the war? What will happen to the OS? The OS meant Onik Shabbos, uh, joy of the Sabbath in Yiddish, Onik Shabbat in Hebrew, which was the code name for this secret archive. And it shows you just how obsessed they were with secrecy. And Ringelblum had very good reason to worry because by the time the war was over, of the 60 or so people that he brought together into this project of documentation, there were only three survivors. And of those three survivors, only one, Hirsch Wasser, knew where they had buried the archive. That is under the ruins of a school in the ghetto under the ruins of Novolipki 68. <coughs> and Wasser survived by the thinnest of margins, once uh, jumping from a train that was taking him to Treblinka. The other two survivors were Wasser's wife, Basha, and Rachel Auerbach, who later on would play a very important role at Yad Vashem and in the Eichmann trial. Those three survivors, after the war, they buttonholed people, they cajoled, they demanded, they pleaded, we have to find this treasure buried under the ruins of the Warsaw ghetto. Uh, and, uh, but if you've seen pictures of what Warsaw looked like in 1945 and 1946, and I hope that slide is visible, uh, you would see that Warsaw was just a heap of rubble after the ghetto uprising of 1943, and then after the Polish uprising of 1944, where 200,000 Poles were killed, Warsaw had been leveled. And so you didn't even know where a street had been, much less where a building had been. But they finally got money from the United States to start looking. They assembled a team of surveyors and engineers. Luckily, a spire of a church was still standing. And using pre-war aerial photographs, uh, they finally kind of, sort of, were able to guess where that building might have been. And they started digging and digging. And then 
on September 18th, 1946, okay, next slide. Uh, on September 18th, 1946, a shovel hit the first of what turned out to be 10 tin boxes. Uh, and this was the uh, first cache of the archive that had been buried on August 3rd, 1942. Uh, are, are, are you seeing uh, Borovich handing up a, a tin box to Hirschwasser? Did you see? Holly, I think you need to advance one slide. Yeah, I think you have to go up one slide. Okay, do, do, do you see that slide? Yeah, good, good. So there were 10 tin boxes. That was the first cache of the archive that had been buried at the beginning of August, 1942. And uh, you see the man in the mustache, his name was Mikhail Borovich, and he was handing a box to Hirschwasser, the one survivor who knew where the archive had been buried, his back is to the camera. I said that Vasser had survived by the thinnest of margins, but you might say that Borovich had survived by an even slimmer margin because he had actually been hanged in 1943 at the Yanovska labor camp in Lvov. But the rope broke and the SS commandant was a gentleman and he decided he wouldn't hang him twice and he was released back into the camp and then he was able to escape. Now, those tin boxes, Wasser said, we buried a lot more, we got to keep looking. But they dug and dug and that's all they could find. And a lot of water had seeped in, a lot of the documents were damaged, uh, but that's what they had. Four years went by. By that time, uh, Poland had become very uh, Stalinist. The three survivors had all gone to Israel. And then on December uh, 1950, as Polish construction workers were uh, building new apartment buildings on the ruins of the old ghetto, uh, they discovered two aluminum milk cans. And those two aluminum milk cans were the second cache of the archive, which had been buried in February, 1943. They thought, my God, they must, these Jews must have buried hidden treasure, gold, diamonds. When they found that they were just documents, they were gonna trash them. But then the foreman, Wojciech, came back from lunch and he said, no, we can't throw these away, we have to give them to the Jewish Historical Institute. And that's how the second cache of the archives survived. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so here you see Hirschwasser and uh, uh, Rachel Auerbach looking at the documents from the tin cans. Uh, next slide. And here you see uh, a photograph on your right of the two aluminum milk cans. Now, Hirschwasser said that in April 1943, just one week before the outbreak of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, they buried yet a third cache uh, under the ruins uh, of the uh, uh, brush maker's shop on Schwenteyerska 34. Uh, they dug and dug, but they could never find that third cache. As time went on, that became the site of the Chinese embassy in Warsaw. Some years ago, the Chinese allowed Israeli scholars to come and dig, but they couldn't find anything. And so there's, the jury is out whether uh, the third cache is uh, still there or whether uh, it was found by Poles after the war who junked it when they discovered that there were no valuables. So as you could see from what I've just said, a lot of the archive is missing. Nonetheless, we have about 25 to 30,000 usable 
documents and artifacts. And the question now rises, why is all this important? And it goes to the title of my book, uh, Who Will Write Our History? Uh, the Germans thought that they were going to write the history uh, of the war, that they would win the war, and that they would decide if and how and what way the memory of the Jews would be transmitted. And the Jews, seeing how the Germans portrayed them in propaganda as rats, as vermin, as carriers of typhus, the Jews knew very well how the Germans would uh, uh, present their image to posterity. As Emanuel Ringelblum's teacher said just before he was murdered in Majdanek, I'm talking about the historian Isaac Schipper, what we know about murdered peoples is usually what their killers choose to say about them. And so Emanuel Ringelblum and other Jews in the ghetto said to themselves, even if we don't live to see it, we will leave time capsules. We will bury documents. We will ensure that posterity will remember us on the basis of Jewish documents and not on the basis of German documents. Now think about this. This was a sublime act of cultural resistance because the Germans not just wanted to murder the Jews, but they wanted to erase their memory. And, 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 and they would be remembered at best as faceless anonymous victims. And the Jews said no. Even if we don't live to see it, we will try to ensure that we will be remembered as individuals. You'll remember our names. You'll remember the names of our kids. You'll remember us as a community. You'll remember what we wrote, our hopes, our dreams, the poetry, the stories that, that we wrote. We will not simply fade into oblivion. And so even though a great part of the archive was lost, nevertheless, in Poland, they just finished publishing what was left of the archive, and that's come to 36 volumes, 36 thick volumes. And because of that, we have more than 10 scholarly studies on the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. That means that we can study the history of the Warsaw Ghetto not just from the point of view of the perpetrators, where the Jews are just objects, but we could study this Jewish community within uh, the ghetto. And this is very important. Uh, think what would have happened had the archive not been found. Uh, people agree today that one of the great Jewish thinkers of the 20th century was the Piasechner Rebbe, uh, Rabbi Kalanimus Shapiro, who was murdered in 1943, wrestling with the theological questions of why this was happening to the Jewish people. Had the archive not been found, none of his writings would have survived. This is just one example. We have 3,600 pages of the Jewish underground press. Again, uh, that would have vanished had the archive not, not been found. So this is very, very important. And in short, I want to remind you that Jews, therefore, resisted, not just with guns. Very few people had access to guns, but they resisted, and they resisted effectively with pen and paper, and not just in the Warsaw Ghetto. The great historian Shimon Dubnov, just before he was murdered in Riga in 1941, his last words were, Yidin Fashai, Jews write everything down. In 1946, under the ruins of crematorium number three in Birkenau, they found glass bottles stuffed with the writings of members of the Sunderkommando. In the Vilna ghetto, Hermann Crook kept a diary uh, which was published uh, by Yale uh, a few years ago and came to 600 pages. The last entry was only four hours before he was killed. Uh, in Krakow, 
a young Jewish woman awaiting execution, Justinia Dranger, kept a long journal on toilet paper, which survived the war and was published by University of Massachusetts Press. Not only did people write to the very end, but uh, there were underground archives, not just in the Warsaw Ghetto, but in Lodz, in Bialystok, in Vilna. But the Oynik Shabbos was certainly uh, the biggest of these ghetto archives and probably the biggest example of this cultural resistance in all of Nazi-occupied Europe. It was different from these archives in, in many ways. Uh, the Oynik Shabbos was a real collective. As I said, Ringelblum brought together 60 people, rabbis like Shimon Huber von, communists like Yehuda Feld, the famous, the not so famous, men and women. The archive was very well organized. There was an organizational committee, which meant every Saturday afternoon, they raised money, they charted strategy, they decided on whom to invite to join uh, the group. There were two secretaries, Wasser and Gutkowski, who uh, kept tabs on everybody who was writing and kept tabs on all the deadlines and who distributed paper, ink, and money and then collected what was written. There was a core of interviewers. Now, you would think that this is a, a pretty routine job, interviewing refugees and people coming into the ghetto from other towns. But in fact, this was a very dangerous job because uh, there was a constant pandemic in the Warsaw Ghetto, a pandemic of typhus. And uh, the, uh, there were more than 100,000 refugees in refugee centers, many of whom were infected with typhus. The interviewers knew that they were risking their lives to get this information. Many of them, in fact, died but they kept on doing their job. There were copiers who tried to make two or three copies of every document, because obviously they didn't have scanners or Xerox machines. There was a technical staff uh, uh, consisting of a school teacher, Israel Lichtenstein, and two of his 17-year-old students. Only they had access to the physical material as it was coming in. Uh, so only those three, plus the two secretaries, plus Ringelblum, knew where the documents were at any time, thereby minimizing the risk that if the Germans caught someone, they would be able to uh, figure out where the material was being kept. The archive was uh, also uh, 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 made more effective because it was wrapped into a huge organization in the Warsaw Ghetto called the Self-Help. The Self-Help ran schools, soup kitchens, refugee centers. It was based on 1,200 house committees in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, so it ran a, a, a large-scale relief activities. But the reason why this was so important is because it got money from the Joint Distribution Committee, an American organization. And because Germany and the United States were not at war until December 1941, and that gave the self-help a kind of quasi-legal status. And that was perfect camouflage for uh, uh, hiding the clandestine activities of the archive uh, and raising all the money necessary to keep it going. The archive also differed from other ghetto archives in the sheer ambition of its agenda, an agenda that kept evolving as time went on. The first agenda item was simply to collect stuff. They collected uh, candy wrappers. They collected uh, uh, tickets to the theater. They collected theater posters. They collected the menus from the fancy restaurants in the ghetto, where Jewish police were speculators, where, the, uh, where, where very, very wealthy people went to spend their money on very nice meals. Uh, these menus uh, are very interesting uh, to look at. Uh, they collected the instructions on how to cook the rotten frozen potatoes 
uh, dumped by the Germans into the ghetto, which were part of the food ration. Then in 1941, the Oynik Shabbos decided that there would be a new agenda item. They would embark on a planned study of uh, Jewish society in Poland under the Nazi occupation. And uh, they chose 80 different topics, women, children, religious life, uh, collaboration, corruption, Polish-Jewish relations, German-Jewish relations. Each topic had a team leader to, uh, to draw up questionnaires and plan interviews. So some members of the archive were team leaders for five or six topics. This study of everyday Jewish life under the Nazi occupation reminds us that Ringelblum, and in fact, most of the members of the executive board had been uh, active in the YIVO, Y-I-V-O, uh, uh, before World War II. Uh, in a sense, the Oynik Shabbos archive was the YIVO in the Warsaw Ghetto. And the byword of the YIVO was to study the Jews, not as a fossil, not as a historical relic, but to study the Jews in Eastern Europe as a living people in Yiddish, study them in such a way as to bring together the scholars and ordinary Jews. Uh, the, 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 one of the uh, fa favorite slogans of the YIVO was Wissenschaft. Now, Wissenschaft is the Yiddish word for science, for knowledge, but there's also a pun. If you take that uh, apart, knowledge creates. The more we know about ourselves, the more we can understand how to protect ourselves psychologically from the blows that are raining down on us. Now, keep in mind that when they decided that they would embark on that study in 1941, uh, they had no idea that the Germans were going to murder all the Jews. The Germans themselves had not yet decided on that. And therefore, they were hoping that by studying how Jews responded to the uh, trauma of occupation, they would gather some self-knowledge, which would help the Jewish community rebuild after the war. The third agenda item uh, began in July 1942. On July 22, 1942, the SS suddenly burst into the office of Judenrat Chairman Adam Chernyakov and said, today and every day, seven to 10,000 Jews will be rounded up by the Jewish police and sent for transport to the east. And the Jewish police had a fixed quota of Jews to round up, thinking thereby they would save their own skins. Well, you know what happened next. Uh, Adam Chernyakov killed himself the next day, preferring to die rather than to uh, be involved in the murder of his own people, but the deportations went on without him. And now, of course, the Oynik Shabbos faced a crisis of life and death. They now had to document mass murder as they themselves were being uh, decimated. Uh, it's at that point that you see that Emanuel Ringelblum himself is on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He doesn't write whole sentences. Uh, his handwriting changes. Uh, he's struggling to keep it together. He's torn between his natural uh, uh, desire as a father and a husband to hide and save his family and his feeling of responsibility to the archive. Uh, he doesn't know what to do but then he pulls himself together and he keeps going. And that's true of the other workers, as every day another key member of the archive was taken off to the Umschlagplatz and then to Treblinka. The 60 became 50, became 40, became 30, became 20. Key members of the archive, like Lewin, uh, like uh, Gorney, come back to see their wives and children taken away. And the question is, the question we can now ask ourselves is at this point, 
why did they keep going? Why didn't they just all collapse? But they did keep going. And an answer to the question I just raised might be found in an essay found in one of the milk cans. This essay was written by a young mother of two, Gustawa Yaretska, who'd been in the Polish Socialist Party before the war. And uh, just before she and her two kids were taken off to Treblinka, uh, she wrote this extraordinary essay. Now, she had been a typist in the offices of the Judenrat. So she had a Judenrat pass. And Ringelblum hoped that that pass would protect her from deportation. And therefore, he asked her to walk the streets of the ghetto during the roundups and write down everything that she saw. And she managed to write down quite a bit before her luck ran out and she was deported. One of the things that she wrote was this. How could you have blamed us Jews for having been brought up to think, for having been educated to think that the history of the world is a history of improvement, that we go from savagery to barbarism to decency, uh, that the prophecies of Isaiah will someday come true, that the wolf and the lamb and the lion will all lie down in peace, that there will be harmony and concord, that we'll beat our swords into plowshares. This is what we were conditioned to think. But now as I see the representatives of the most educated nation in Europe killing children in the street, I realize that it was all the opposite, that the story of mankind is a regression, that history is going in the direction of savagery and barbarism. And if that indeed is the case, and now I'm quoting her directly, if that indeed is the case, then I hope that my words will be like a stone under history's wheel, that my words will be like a stone under history's wheel, meaning that someday if somebody finds what I've just written, they will say, oh my God, how could we have allowed this to take place? Let's make sure that such a disaster will never happen again. And uh, uh, this became the reason why they kept on going, even as their world was collapsing all around them. Now, it was after the beginning of the mass murder that escapees from the death camps began to trickle into the Warsaw Ghetto. One escapee from Chelno, and then five or six escapees from Treblinka. And they were the ones to give the first eyewitness accounts of the actual process of mass murder. One of these escapees, Avram Shapitsky, who spent uh, 13 days in Treblinka in August and September 1942, was taken in hand by the archive, interviewed by Rachel Auerbach. The Yiddish typewritten uh, transcript of that interview goes to more than 100 pages. He even draws a map of Treblinka. And uh, on the basis of these interviews and on the basis of other interviews being gathered uh, by the Oenik Shabbos archive, uh, they managed to send out four detailed reports to London, to the Polish government in exile, using the channels of the Polish underground. Uh, the last report, sent in November 1942, contained a detailed map of Treblinka, a, a detailed description of the camp, including the color of the tiles inside the gas chambers. All of this sent to London in real time while Treblinka was still uh, working. So uh, they really did their best to resist in every way that was possible for them to do so. Now, Ringelblum's byword was, write everything down immediately. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't say, well, I'm not going to write this because it's not important, or I don't have time to write today. What Ringelblum said is, it's not for you to decide what's important, and you don't know if you'll be alive tomorrow. And between today and tomorrow, such terrible things might happen to you that you'll be so changed 
that you uh, uh, won't understand the importance of what you saw now. So everything you see, write it immediately. In other words, Ringelblum, a trained historian, instinctively grasped the difference between real-time uh, testimony that the archive was getting uh, by people who didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow, people who were living in a ghetto, which was still a living community. It was not a concentration camp. It had social space. The ghetto was still affected by pre-war norms. The, that testimony in real time transmitted the fears, the hopes, the fight for survival of people who, who didn't know how it was going to end. And this kind of material would give historians very different kinds of information from the material that would be gathered by survivors after the war. After the war, people who survived, they focused on how they survived. They knew the outcome. They knew what happened next. The story of the community, the ghetto, the political movements, the aspirations of the community before the murder, this would have been overshadowed by the story of personal survival. And let me give you an example of why this is important. Uh, Ringelblum chose uh, a, a woman, Cecilia Slapakova, to supervise the study of Jewish women under the Nazi occupation. And uh, before Cecilia Slapakova and her daughter were murdered in Treblinka, this woman had interviewed uh, many, many people, uh, many different kinds of women, uh, PhDs, librarians, prostitutes, uh, uh, vegetable sellers. And she wrote this amazing essay on Jewish women in the war, which was completed in May 1942. And in this essay, Slapakova says, we can come to certain conclusions. We've seen that women are psychologically more resilient than men, that as time goes on, men are more and more prone to depression and despair, and the heavy lifting of keeping the ghetto going, the schools, the soup kitchens, the daycare centers, this falls more and more on the shoulders of the women. And I am convinced that when this war is over, the Jewish woman in Poland will not let herself be pushed back into the kitchen. She will demand a place at the table. Now, had Cecilia Slapakova survived and ended up in New York City as a survivor, and her grandchildren said, Bobby, can you give an interview of what happened to you during the war? She totally would have forgotten that once upon a time, she was waxing lyrical about the future of Jewish women in Poland. She would have focused on her own story, and that was that. Uh, so this is an example. Because of the archive, we're able to understand and hear the different voices of Polish Jewry at the very end. The essays written by children in June 1942, what do I want to do when the war is over? The theological essays of the Piasechna Rebbe, why is this happening to the Jewish people? The, uh, uh, a a, a uh, report written by a very ordinary Jewish woman, Mrs. Kaplan, about her house committee, a meeting with Mrs. Cohn and Mrs. Weinberg, getting together a list of kids in the building that they don't think are getting any food at all and trying to match them up with families who might be willing to feed them. The jottings of a ghetto mailman, Peretz Opachinsky, who describes how at the height of the great deportation, uh, the Germans put little toddlers on a bench in the blazing sun as they were doing selections. And these kids were crying for their parents. And any Jew who went up to these kids to try to give them some water was badly beaten. And these children were left to suffer. And Opachinsky said the Germans didn't need to keep that bench there. They could have taken it away. Why did they keep that bench there? So we Jews could have suffered just a little bit more, just a little bit more. And there's another document 
found in the milk cans, which is an extraordinary document. And uh, the person who wrote it, I'm sure would not have written this had he survived the war. I'm talking about a Yiddish writer, Shia Perle, who uh, was killed in Auschwitz in 1943. But on August 25th, 1942, Shia Perla walked by the following scene. A Jewish policeman was dragging a five-year-old little boy to his SS handler and said, this is my fifth head of the day. Now they had to provide a quota thinking they would save their own skins. The SS man very casually drew out a pistol, shot the little boy, and as the little boy was dying on the pavement, the SS man flicked his hand and said, this little dog doesn't count as a head. Go get an adult. And uh, the policeman scampered off to find an adult Jew. And Perla was so shaken, so angry, that he went back and he wrote the following. How could a people produce such scum as the Jewish police? Maybe a people that can produce that could spawn such bastards and sons of bitches is a people that deserves everything it's getting. Now, clearly after the war, the six million martyrs, the six million kadoshim, don't speak ill of the dead. This never would have been said. Perlin never would have said this. But this also underscores a key difference between real-time wartime writing and post-war writing. In the writing that we see from the ghettos in real time, it's full of anger against other Jews. A, uh, it's, it's full of rage. The Jews saw uh, uh, their fellow Jews more than they saw Germans. And keep something else in mind. They did not know that there would be a state of Israel after the war. All they saw was the destruction of the Jewish people without any shred of comfort, without any hope that there would be some tiny form of redemption when the war was over. The bitterness and rage were incredible. Now, there's another question that you might want to ask, which is that since this document was found in the milk can, well, Ringelblum read it. Uh, this went through Ringelblum's hands. And Ringelblum could very easily have said, uh-uh, this isn't going in the milk can. This makes the Jews look bad. But he put it in. He put it in because he believed in facts. He didn't believe in alternative facts. He wanted the whole story, the good and the bad, so that future historians would trust him and respect him. And something else, by including documents that told the story of the Jewish police and the collaborators and the informers. Ringelblum said in an essay he, he wrote that if historians look at this, they will then better appreciate what he believed was the real story. The real story was what Ringelblum called in Yiddish, the stille Heldentum von dem Jüdischen Massenmensch, the quiet heroism of the ordinary Jew the hundreds of thousands of ordinary Jews who didn't have connections, didn't have money, who were doomed, who had no chance of survival, but who struggled to help their neighbors, help their families, maintain their human dignity. And this was the important thing for Ringelblum. Now, uh, because our time is limited, uh, there's a lot I'd like to say about Ringelblum himself, which uh, I uh, don't think I'll have time to get into. I'll just very quickly say that uh, he was born in 1900 in Buchach, Galicia, the same town that Shai Agnon, the Israeli Nobel laureate, came from. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they were cousins. Uh, before World War II, he wore three hats. One hat was in politics. He was a key member of a Marxist political group called the Left Labor Zionists, which were pro-Soviet, which were pro-Yiddish, which wanted a binational state in Palestine. 
uh, Ringel Bloom, uh, 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 like everybody else in uh, Jewish parties in Poland, the party was not a, 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 a route to power. The party offered no hope for a career, what the party did give you was a family. And Ringelblum met his spouse in the ranks of uh, the party. Uh, next slide, please. Could I, could I see the next slide? Are, are, are you seeing the slide of Ringelblum, his, his wife and son? Yes, no? It's coming up in a moment. Okay. okay, that's the young, that's Ring of Blue. Okay, that's the slide that I want you to see. He uh, met a young woman named uh, Yehudit uh, Cutler, came from a Hasidic family, and they had one uh, child, Yuri, who was born in 1930, and he was the apple of Ringel Bloom's eye. Okay, ne next slide. Okay, uh, Ringel Bloom worked many jobs to make ends meet. And uh, one of his jobs was uh, teaching in a uh, posh upper middle class Jewish girls school in Warsaw, where uh, the language of instruction was Polish. And I tracked down one of his former students uh, years later. And uh, she said that they used to you know, make fun of Ringel Bloom. He'd always come in a little sweaty, a little bit late, and a little, little bit of the absent-minded professor. And when they didn't want to take an exam on a particular day, uh, one of them would be delegated to raise her hand and say, uh, Dr. Ringel Bloom, uh, you didn't talk about your son for a while. How's he doing? And he would, the proud father, would then pull out his wallet and show pictures and all the girls would have time uh, to uh, uh, have an extra couple of days to study for, for the exam. But Ringelblum took away from the left labor Zionists a commitment to Yiddish culture and real political dedication. The second hat he wore was as a community activist and a community organizer. And the third hat he wore was as a historian. He got a PhD in history from Warsaw University in 1926, and he wrote four books before the war, even though he only had time to uh, write uh, uh, late, uh, late in the evening when everybody was in bed. And as a historian, Ringelblum firmly believed that Jewish history has to be the history not just of rabbis and philosophers and scholars, but Jewish history has to be the history of the forgotten people, women, uh, young people, apprentices, actors, beggars. To do this, you need different sources. You need to go to the people. You need to find out uh, their, their folklore, their proverbs. You have to build your own archives. And this is one of the things he was doing in the Evo before the war. Ringelblum also believed that history was a powerful weapon, that the more Poles knew about Jews, the less anti-Semitic they would be. Now, this was not true, but this is what he uh, believed. On the fourth day of the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, Ringelblum was caught by the Germans and sent to the Trubniki labor camp, from which he made a daring escape in August 1943. And he wound up on the Aryan side of Warsaw in a bunker with 37 Jews, including his wife and son. 37 Jews in a bunker. It was under a hothouse uh, maintained by a Polish family with financial contributions from an underground Jewish organization. The atmosphere in that bunker was terrible. It was stifling. There were, the, nobody had any room. There were arguments. There were fights. Uh, two people left the bunker against the rules. They survived the war and went to Israel. Uh, and uh, they described how in the middle of this bedlam, Ringelblum sat in a corner 
And by the light of a carbide lamp, he wrote and wrote and wrote. And once a week, a courier, von der Rotenberg, would come and take what he wrote, give him more and more paper. And I tried to sit down, talk to her and tell her. Bill Bloom literally wrote thousands of pages about the writers of this great Polish-Jewish community who were murdered. And Ringel Bloom believed that this was the only memory of them that would survive. He had a chance to leave the bunker and go to relatives safely, but he turned it down. He felt he had a, a mission to fulfill to the Jewish people. It was in the bunker that Ringel Bloom wrote a masterpiece. Polish-Jewish relations in the Second World War. Uh, he didn't have grad students. He didn't have a library. He, he, he wrote it without any help. And yet this was published in English in 1992. And in many ways, it stood the test of time. Polish-Jewish relations in the Second World War. He felt the weight of a terrible responsibility on his shoulders. Eight centuries of shared life in, in Poland, Poles and Jews coming to an end in bitterness and anger and mutual recriminations. And he felt this crushing sense of responsibility that he was the last Jewish historian left. And so he wrote an introduction where this radical Marxist compared himself to a cipher, to a person who writes a Torah scroll. And he said, just like a cipher has to go to a mikvah to purify himself of, 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 all, uh, of all blemish. And a cipher can't make any mistake. I feel that I uh, have to purify myself and that I can't afford to make any mistake as I write this. And then he sat down to try to write an objective account, even though he was writing not as a scholar, but also as a victim. And he was just struggling to uh, uh, keep his thoughts together. And he went out of his way to point out the objective difficulties that Poles had in helping Jews. The death penalty, if they were caught, and we know of 750 Poles who were caught for helping Jews and who were executed. Uh, he pointed out the bravery of the Poles, their patriotism, their courage. Uh, but then he went on to say that uh, Polish society had uh, betrayed the Jewish people, that the Poles who helped Jews were individuals, but that the underground government, the underground state, uh, turned its back on its fellow citizens who were Jewish. And he cited an incident that he just heard, that just a few weeks before on the streets of Warsaw, the Germans were chasing a Polish resistance fighter who was running. And all the Germans had to do was yell into the crowd, catch the Jew. And people were willing to step forward to catch the Jew. In other words, helping Jews was not socially respectable. And Ringelblum concluded by saying that the Poles had failed their test of solidarity with the Jewish people. On March 7, 1944, a Polish informer had led the Gestapo to the hideout, and all the Jews and two Poles were taken to the Paviak prison. There was a, a prisoner in the Paviak, a journalist who survived the war, uh, and I tracked down uh, his wife after the war. Uh, uh, in the 1990s. And he writes that when they heard that Ringelblum was taken into the prison, uh, they struggled to find some way to save him. And Hirschout went into Ringelblum's cell. And Ringelblum was black and blue. He'd been beaten and tortured, and Yuri was sitting on his lap. And Hirschout out outlined a scheme. They would pay off an SS guard. They would get him out of the cell into another cell. They would, you know, somehow try to blend him into the prison population. And Ringelblum 
pointed to his son, his wife, what about them? Hirschout shook his head, no, we can't do anything for them. And Ringelblum said, no, I, I want to die with my wife and child. And uh, the last words that Hirschout remembers Ringelblum saying in Yiddish, was is er schuldig der Kleiner zu lieben, weitig noch stark das Haus. Pointing at the little boy, why is this little kid guilty? What did he do? My heart is breaking because of him. The next day, March 10th, all the Jews and two of the Poles were shot uh, in the ruins of the ghetto. I want to end this talk by going back to the night of August 3rd, 1942, when Israel Lichtenstein and those two teenagers were ordered by Ringelblum to bury the first cache of uh, the archive. And 100,000 Jews had already been deported to Treblinka. It was the 12th day of the deportation. Uh, the Germans were only 50 yards away. Uh, they were stuffing documents into the tin boxes, and they were all writing their last wills and testaments. And miraculously, all those last wills and testaments survived. And Israel Lichtenstein said, I don't want praise. I want to be remembered. My name is Israel Lichtenstein. I want my wife to be remembered. Her name is Gela Sextein. She's a great artist. She designed children's sets for the theater in the ghetto. I remember my, I, I want my little daughter to be remembered, Margalit, 20 months old, but a brilliant girl. And if you don't believe me, ask her teachers. And he adds the name of her teachers. I want them all to be remembered. And then he said, I believe that the Jews of Eastern Europe are a redeeming sacrifice for the Jewish people. The Jewish people will survive. And so in his last months of life, Lichtenstein reminded us that the Jews were not anonymous victims, but Jews fought for their right to be remembered as individuals and as members of a, a proud and resilient uh, nation. And, and this is the legacy of the Oynik Shabbos. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess now I'll take questions. No, thank you, Dr. Kasso. Um, I'd like to um, bring on um, Daniel Berkowitz before we take questions. How's that? Am I unmuted? You are, we hear you. Okay, where's my lovely picture? Actually, the picture, still picture is better than my real picture, so maybe. Uh, you have a picture of me there or what? The host has asked you to start the yes. video. Oh, okay, okay. There we go. Okay. So first of all, I'm Dan Berkowitz. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. I think you've all had a very informative, very informative uh, morning. I want to thank my co-hosts, Holly Rosenbink and Amy Fastenberg, who co-directed this program with me. It's been a lot of work and um, I think we'll, we'll see how it was, uh, how it was liked by the congregation, I guess. So before we go any further, this program is dedicated to Joram Mormund, a beloved member of our committee who died after fighting his valiant fight against pancreatic cancer. He was my very good friend. He was a wonderful teacher, a vital member of this committee. He was a key member in bringing this event to you. Um, today, no, that's a little out of out of uh, out of sync. Um, I do want to recognize, where is Myra? Um, Lachin, 
for co-hosting this event. Uh, she is the head of the Adult Education Committee and uh, has been a very cooperative co-worker, co-host on, on this very important uh, project. I want to go right to the, uh, to the questions. Holly, do we have any questions from the audience? We do, Amy. Take mm -hmm. it from here. We have one question, for, a question from Shira Weinstein, and she was wondering about the rabbi in the ghetto um, and in his writings, what was the theological reason um, that he presented for the Holocaust in his thought, in his writings? Yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, complicated uh, question. Uh, there are a lot of books written on this. Uh, I mean, one book I recommend is Nehemia Poland. Uh, but there's a, there's a process of evolution going on in his reasoning. For example, in 1940, he's basically giving you the standard line that uh, we've been, we're being punished for our sins. Uh, we're being punished for uh, not observing Shabbos, We've, we're being punished for turning away for our religion, and so on. And then he goes on to say, this has happened to us before in Jewish history, the, uh, the destruction of the uh, second temple, destruction of the first temple, uh, the Chabelnitsky massacres, and this is not fundamentally different. That's what he said in 1940-41. By 1942, he was struggling. He was coming to understand that this indeed is something very, very different. And then in July 1942, he gave a sermon where he was saying, how can we make sense of this? Well, let's compare two Jewish holidays. Let's compare uh, Purim and let's compare Hanukkah. In both holidays, the Jews were in great danger. In both holidays, the Jews were in danger of annihilation. But with Purim, the Jews were in danger because of sins that they had. Uh... How did he get muted? Muted, I am unmuted. Am I now, can you hear me? Okay. The Jews, uh, what happened at Purim was that uh, the Jews were uh, uh, being paid back for their neglect of their religion. And uh, it was only because of Esther's willingness to put her life on the line to plead for her people that the evil decree was averted. But Hanukkah was something different. Hanukkah, the Jews were also in great danger. But uh, that danger was not because they were being punished for their sins. That was because the, uh, the Greeks were not just trying to destroy the Jewish people physically, as Haman was trying to do, but the Greeks were trying to destroy the message of the Torah. The, Jews were, the Greeks were trying to extinguish the light of the Torah from the world. And the Jews were soldiers defending the Torah. Uh, defending the, the light of the Torah in this world. And as soldiers, their lives were endangered, and many of them died, but th they died for Kiddush Hashem, and they died for a good cause. And later on, he went even further. As the Jews were totally decimated, and here I'm getting into something incredibly abstruse and complicated, so I, I, I kind of, you know, hope you'll turn to the relevant literature. He, he develops an image of, uh, of God who is, uh, who's, who, who is so, uh, uh, distraught at the murder of the Jewish people, that he faces a kind of a Hobson's choice. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure the rabbi has studied this and he would correct me, but that if God were to say, I'm going to put a stop to this, 
his anger would be so great that it might destroy the world, just as the world was almost destroyed during the flood. And so rather than take the risk of letting that anger uh, so engulf the world, God weeps, God mourns. And, and uh, this is a weeping which is being done uh, in, in silence and in isolation. Uh, so, you know, this is a work in uh, progress as it's going on. But uh, there's quite a lot that, that's been written on the Piasechna Rebbe, uh, and I recommend that you actually go to the literature. Although, you know, he himself is worth, uh, I think about five, 10 books have been written on him so far. Uh, I mean, I'd be glad to talk some more, but it gets us into very uh, uh, abstruse kind of logic. Thank you, Dr. Kassa. We have other questions, so um, I can go ahead to those. One um, question is, how can we take a closer look at the items in the archives? Well, uh, as I said, uh, there's a 36 volume uh, collection just been finished in, at, by the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. That's in Polish, that's digitized. But for those of us who read English, uh, they're uh, uh, putting out a 10 volume edition of the most important documents in the archives in English, and uh, th three volumes have already appeared. And uh, you can you could access those on the website of the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. Now, in the archive itself, of the documents that survived, about 50% were written in Polish, 45% in Yiddish, 5% in other languages. The way it's being published, at the end of each volume, there's a CD-ROM, which contains facsimiles of all the documents. So all the documents are published in Polish, but you can see the Yiddish originals for, or the Hebrew originals for those documents that, that weren't. Thank you. Um, now, another question Myra was wondering, did Ringo Bloom know the contents of the tins and milk cans in his head? Did he have a, an awareness of everything, every, every item, and how many are still unaccompanied for now? Yeah, he, he knew the, the contents of everything because everything went through his hands. In other words, the, phys the, the physical journey from, a, from writing a document to going into the milk can or the tin boxes went through Ringelblum. Now, uh, let me just add a caveat that for the first cache, keep in mind on July 22nd, the Germans suddenly begin the deportation. Four days later, Ringelblum calls an emergency meeting of the executive committee. Uh, we have no time to lose. We have to collect all of the work in progress all of the unfinished essays, all the unfinished studies. We just have to bring it together and stuff it into uh, boxes and hide it now because we might be dead in a couple days. So that process was so rushed and so confused that it's possible that with the first cache, he did not know every single document that went in. The second cache, that was certainly true, that, 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 that he did know. How many documents are unaccounted for? Well, there may the third cache was never found. Uh, many documents in the first cache were ruined by seepage, especially documents written in ink. Uh, they uh, collected thousands of photographs. Uh, by the way, is is there a final slide that that hasn't been shown? Is it possible to see that final slide? Yes, no, uh, uh, the, uh, there's one after that. Yeah, oh, okay, this, this is an interesting picture. The... Oh, oh shoot, I muted the, Dr. Casso. Unmute. Muting. Okay, yeah, what are you doing? Oh, okay, can you, can, can you hear me? I did not. So the Germans were always sending photographers into the ghetto. 
uh, and film crews into the ghetto. The Germans were using the camera as a weapon of propaganda to, to dehumanize the Jews. So the Einik Shabbos tried to use the camera to tell a different story. The Einik Shabbos took as many photographs as it could, showing Jews uh, as active people uh, trying to uh, help their children, trying to uh, 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 fight the German uh, attempt to starve them out. Uh, and so this is an example of one of the few pictures that survived the seepage into the tin boxes. This is a, a picture of smugglers smuggling food into the Warsaw Ghetto, taken sometime in 1941 or 42. The official German rations were about 184 calories a day. With the soup kitchens and so on, the rations went up to about 500 calories a day. And yet, by July 1942, only, quote unquote, only 20% of the Jews in the ghetto had died of starvation or disease. That meant that 80% of the Jews were still alive after two years. The head of the Judenrat said in his diary that 90% of the calories in the Warsaw ghetto were smuggled in. It was the smuggling that saved the ghetto. This smuggling was massive, it was organized, and it showed Jewish agency. And this is an example of the kind of picture that the Oynik Shabbos was trying to uh, keep. Uh, uh, Dr. Kassow, I'd like to ask one question, follow up, <clears throat> and then a question that Yoram, Yoram would have presented to you were he here with us. The question I have, the follow up, is about religion about the Holocaust's effect on religious or religiosity. Do we have any data as to how many religious people maintained a religion and so forth and so on? Yeah, the, I mean, it's a tough question to ask. I mean, the, the, the archive did try to gather material about that. Uh, the general uh, uh, information was that there was a sharp fall off in religious observance. Uh, on the eve of the war, uh, about 30 to 40 percent of Polish Jewry was what we would call very observant, and about uh, 30 percent were traditional. That is, they would go to Shul on Shabbos, they would uh, uh, eat kosher, but uh, they would not observe Shabbat the way very religious people do uh, today. And then there were about 20% who were militantly non-religious. Now, in the ghettos, for the most part, religious observance tended to erode. Uh, on the other hand, Jews did make a big effort, even if they were not personally observant, to maintain the key holidays, to keep Pesach, to fast on Yom Kippur. Uh, in the Lodz ghetto in 1943, Rumkowski got permission from the Germans to have Yom Kippur as a day off. And uh, this was the third year in the ghetto, and Jews made an effort to fast, to observe the holiday, uh, people walked in the streets with their families. And uh, uh, so there was this, this effort to mark the holidays. But in terms of strict religious observance, that really uh, declined. The uh, question, thank you, Dr. Kassel. The question that Joram, one of the questions Joram had, was a discussion concerning the internal divisions among Jewish leadership groups, such as the Judenrat, the House Committees, the soup distribution organizations, the police service squad, the smugglers, proponents for armed resistance, the religious slash intellectual groups. What prevented them from forming a more cohesive approach? Well, keep in mind that there were 900 ghettos. Each ghetto was different. 
In some ghettos, there was a very close collaboration between the Judenrat and other groups in the ghetto. Uh, in the Warsaw ghetto, there was a lot of mutual suspicion. Uh, there were many reasons for that. Warsaw had uh, 400,000 Jews before the war, and Warsaw, the Warsaw Jewish community was very diverse. Uh, it was divided between Polish-speaking Jews and Yiddish-speaking Jews. There were Hasidim, there were members of the Bund, uh, you had uh, uh, acculturated professionals, uh, it's, and and uh, so there was there had been a lot of infighting before the war. There was a lot of mistrust of the Judenrat. Uh, the Onik Shabbos archive in the Warsaw Ghetto uh, made it a rule not to have anything to do with the Judenrat. Uh, but the other ghetto archives in Lodge and Vilna, they were closely integrated with the Judenrat. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to make a hard and fast rule. It depended on the personalities and the conditions in the, each ghetto. There was, no, uh, uh, there, there was no uniformity. Thank you. Dr. Oh, I, there's another question. It's actually from my son, um, and it's a big question. He, how is the history of Polish-Jewish relations during the Second World War understood in contemporary Poland? Um, and has Poland ever confronted the question of complicity and betrayal towards the Jewish po population? I know that's a giant question. That's a, yeah, I mean, I, I was uh, invited as a scholar in residence in Nantucket last summer. And the whole weekend was devoted to that question. Uh, I, I just finished writing a 25-page article about that. It's a huge question. Uh, in contemporary Poland, yes, it's a very painful issue. Uh, there are some historians and there are some uh, groups who want Poles to take an un, unalloyed, honest look at Polish-Jewish relations in the war, even though there are many painful examples of Poles killing Jews or handing Jews over. On the other hand, there are Poles who say, listen, we suffered plenty. Uh, we uh, 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 risked the death penalty for helping Jews. Uh, the, our record is one of heroism and uh, let's not spit into our own well. So uh, until the election of the present government in 2015, the tendency in Poland was to uh, expose the truth about the very painful trajectory of Polish-Jewish relations during the war. Since 2015, the trajectory has been make Poland great again. Uh, and, and that means telling a feel-good story about Polish heroism and how Poles did all they could to help Jews. So I, you know, instead of three hours, I've given this in one minute. Thank you, um, Dr. Casso. Another question is about um, the, co the connection um, with the outside world that Ringel Bloom and the others had um, with the underground and others outside of the ghetto during the course of the war, and um, perhaps also with the JDC and YIVO. Oh, okay. Uh, the the most uh, the the JDC was a key connection, uh, especially before December forty one, uh, when the United States was a neutral country. And uh, the JDC had what you might call a privileged position. Uh, then, there, then there was, of course, the, the, the key connection with the outside world was through the Polish underground. The Polish underground kept sending couriers in and out of Poland. And uh, these couriers uh, relayed information, including the four Onik Shabbos reports. Uh, the uh, technical way this was affected uh, was probably through the mediation of the Jewish Labor Bund, which was uh, represented 
uh, in the Polish Socialist Party, which was in turn a member of, of uh, the underground. So that was the main contact with the outside world. Uh, then, of course, there was a Jewish National Committee, which operated in secret after the ghetto was liquidated. And this committee would get money from London to help Jews in hiding. And uh, some of this money went to Ringelblum, who was in hiding. But again, all of the actual channels went through the Polish underground couriers. Hmm. Another question is about history courses in universities, um, Holocaust courses in universities, and do they include the Oineg Shabbos archives and history in their curricula, or to what extent are these taught? You mean here in the U.S.? Um, I'm not sure what this, the questioner was meaning, but I guess either. Uh, for the most part, no. But uh, again, I, I can't speak to all these courses because I just teach in, in one institution. I've taught in many, actually. But I obviously use the materials. Uh, I think as time goes on, more and more people will. Right. Um, and I don't see more questions here. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Amy, how many more questions do you have? We were thinking we would stop in a couple of minutes. Um, so yeah. if, if you that. have another question. Uh, do you have one? Because I... I can also. Sure. A little, I know, Dr. Casso, um, you addressed this a little bit, but I think we heard that you're also studying the Loj ghetto, ghetto, and are there comparisons that you can make with that? Yeah, I mean, the Lodge ghetto, the, if you look at the Lodge ghetto, it kind of underscores the point I made that no two ghettos were alike. For example, as I said just before, between 85 and 90% of the food in the Warsaw Ghetto was smuggled in. In the Lodge Ghetto, no food was smuggled in. Uh, that is, you depended on what the Germans allocated. Why was this so? The Warsaw Ghetto was in the so-called general government. Uh, the, that is the German administrative area of occupied Poland. Uh, on the other side of the ghetto wall, there was a so-called Aryan side. On the other side of the wall in the Warsaw Ghetto, there were Poles. The Poles didn't necessarily love the Jews, but they hated the Germans, and they would do business with the ghetto. Uh, so the Warsaw Ghetto uh, existed in the context of occupied Poland. The Warsaw Ghetto was what you might call a more open ghetto in that not ev in that most of the economic life of the ghetto was not regimented by the Judenrat. Uh, that you had private uh, it's private enterprises for what that's worth, private stores in the large ghetto. Uh, large was annexed to the Reich. It was renamed Litzmannstadt. The Poles were deported. So there was no Aryan side. The people on the other side of the ghetto wall were Volksdeutschen, were ethnic Germans or Germans. The ghetto was hermetically sealed. In four years, underground Jewish groups were not able to infiltrate one delegate into the large ghetto or one pistol. Uh, the large ghetto was totally uh, dictatorial. Uh, the head of the uh, Judenrat was Chaim Rumkowski. Uh, he uh, uh, was a very authoritarian kind of a ruler. Of course, he believed that he did what he had to do to buy time uh, for the ghetto. Uh, the ghetto was turned into a beehive of activity for the German war machine. By 1944, uh, there were 117 different factories in the large ghetto. And because of this a uh, different kind of status, the large ghetto survived until August 1944, whereas the Warsaw Ghetto was liquidated in 42 and 43. 
And there are many, many other differences, but those are just some. Thank you. Holly. Thank you, Dr. Gaza. Um, question or? Any, any, any burning questions or should we end it here? One more question is whether the Jews became more politicized or during their time in the ghetto. Okay. It de did they become more, it depends which Jews. I mean, youth movements became more politicized. They, they planned the ghetto uprising. Uh, other people became apathetic and uh, desperate. Uh, other people uh, t turned inward towards their own concerns. So it's, it's hard to make a generalization. So many of you may not be aware, but Dr. Kassow was a headline speaker at our show event, I think it was six years ago. Is that about right, Dr. Kassow? Could be, yeah. Just yeah. when his book uh, had been published. And so we were very happy to see him back after the film was made. We didn't talk much about the film, Dr. Kassow. Do you find it was a true representation of your book? No, it, it tells only a very tiny bit of what's in the book, but that's what a film could, could do. I mean, uh, there were many, many, many hours of filming and only 90 minutes made it uh, into the film. But, you know, the fact is that as the survivors leave us, uh, people are not going to learn about the story from books. They're going to learn about it from film and from novels. And so films are going to be very important going forward. And in that sense, I think the film uh, is very well done. And it's a tribute to the producers and directors, Roberta Grossman, and Nancy Spielberg. Well, then thank you again to all my co-workers, to the Adult Ed Committee. And we'll do this again and again and again. Okay, as long as show us. Thank you. Thank you to the uh, Holocaust Education Committee and to Daniel, to Holly, to Amy, to all those uh, involved. It was a beautiful event. Almost 50 people here to, uh, to memorialize. Thank you, Dr. Casa. Uh, very, very uh, interesting. And uh, we really appreciate uh, all the effort that was put by so many into this. Uh, Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone the recording of this conversation will be up on the website tomorrow. Um, and I also want to thank Dan for bringing Dr. Cassell to us today. And um, a week from today, we actually will have the WJC will be hosting the producer of the hit show Stitzel. Um, and I hope that you all can attend that one too. And have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. It was excellent. Mm -hmm. What you said? I am waiting. I'm just waiting, standing up. We see you around. I am.